the story of, of what we believe is God's prophetic plan for Thailand and Southeast Asia is another whole chapter. But I trekked the hills in the north in 1995, and um, I thought I was going to die. It was physically the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole life, because like I'm not a, a teenager anymore, and I can do all kinds of hard, but physical hard I don't do. That's like anyway. So I said, God, I'm going to die up here if you don't do something. So I really prayed, and God really, really, really. Uh, put something in my heart that not only saved me then, but is still working today. And you know the wars that went on in Vietnam and in Cambodia, they went on in the north of Thailand. And so they had bomber planes and they had tanks and they had fighting up in the hills in the north in no man's land. And no one was helping Thailand. Like it was the U.S. helping Vietnam, even they couldn't stay free. Right? And no one was helping Thailand. but. God will never be without a witness. And so God sovereignly saved this nation. In that same war, it's when, and I think it's because the Prince of Darkness said, okay, if I can't win by physical war, I'll, I'll, I'll start a war of lust. And it was that same war that started all of the military that were all in this part of the world coming to Thailand for R&R. &R. And so Satan tried to destroy Thailand then from the inside out if he couldn't rule them from the outside in. Because Thailand is one nation that sits in the center of all of these other nations um, that for different reasons the gospel is restricted. Uh, Burma is a military dictatorship where the, the genocide and the, the child abuse and the trafficking that we have no idea, we only hear the tiniest tip of what goes on in that nation. And it borders on Thailand. And, and God wants us to be able to go there. And he wants them to be able to come here. So it's the same with Cambodia, whose soul was ripped out in war. And, and when you look at them, they're like the walking dead. Because God didn't create the human soul to endure what they had to see. And so, and, and in all of these things, in China and all these nations around us, I believe it's Thailand's destiny to be like a, like a spiritual pentagon, uh, to resource and direct God's kingdom war efforts in all these nations around us. But it's not enough just to pray. We have to go. And so how do we go? And how do we gather uh, the hearts and minds of all of the people who are here to join us in the task. And how do we preach the gospel in a nation that, that is, you know, like 95% Buddhist and, and uh, you know, the yada yada. Well, God wants to show mercy. Every time, and this I, I, I scatter, but it's pieces of the puzzle. Every time the people of Israel backslid in the Old Testament and the prophets came, they said two things. They said, you've worshipped other gods and you've forgotten the poor. And they're connected. And if you're going to do one, you'll do the other. And so people who will help us care for the poor are very close to the kingdom of God. And at the moment here at Mercy, 75% of the volunteers and the resources that come to us come from people who don't know anything about the kingdom of God. If you ask them, they'd say they don't believe. And they're homosexuals, and they're bar boys, and they're motorcycle guys. And they're people like Pat who think God is responsible for all the hell in the earth. And they get involved and they begin to see. Because we say to them, no, you pray. You know, we told Pat, Pat would say, I don't even believe, I can't pray. I say, you pray. There's not enough of us to pray. You go put your hands on them, and you just, you know, say, God, please help them. And inside she's saying, like, God, if you're really there, you know. But then God's love would pour through her for the poor and for the children. And she would say, what is that? And we'd say, sweetheart, that's God. And she knows the love. She just didn't know the source, you know. So now she's connected. Can you imagine what she can do? She is like just so called. The devil's tried to kill her how many times with cancer? And he couldn't do it. 
because she carries the heart of God even though she didn't know what it was. And if this goes any way to like um, extreme prophetic, it's out of the box stuff. Yes, God will use people who don't even know him to do his work. And because they will do his work, he will bless them. God will not be indebted to anyone. And when he blesses them, he gets their attention and they get hooked. And we just get to walk with them and interpret it and say, this is that. So the Christians who come to us, or the God believers who come to us, who live in, in their worlds, wherever they might be, you know, they're doing the best they can, but they just have never had opportunity to do the right stuff. You know, well, it, it's not complicated here, because the poor are just outside, in the naked, no, if you've got two shirts, okay, bring one, let's go find someone who has no shirt and give it to them, and people go, wow, like that's cool, right, just, you know, and then you capture their hearts, because who doesn't want to do that, and who doesn't want to show mercy, hey, give me a break, everyone wants to show mercy, so we just invite everyone into this kind of work in motion, right, and um, we believe um, that, that that's what our church is to do. We, we are here to make disciples. If they come to us as believers, we work to make them into disciples. If they come to us as pre-believers, unbelievers, we work to make them as disciples. Discipleship here in Thailand of Mercy in our church begins the moment they come through the door. And we don't care much about where they came from that's the story they tell us as we go along. But if they come through the door, we just choose to believe God has brought them, and that's when discipleship begins. And so we have people all over the city who are transvestites and gays and ladyboys and motorcycle guys, as well as all kinds of straight people. And it's like mercy is the mixing pot. And it's really, really hard because we can never, we never, never, never want to dilute the gospel or say that it doesn't matter to God. And we say we believe the gospel 100% here. That's what we preach. But what we say to them is that, you know, you have your story that brought you here. And if you tell us your story, we can probably see God's fingerprint in your life. Because God speaks, right? God does that. Every life in the world, He works that from the beginning. And so He's taught us to see His tracks. You know? And if we can see His tracks, we can say, T tell me more about that time when... And, and then we can say, you know, I think that was God trying to talk to you. And most times they'll start to cry. And they'll say, oh my goodness, of course it was. And then they stop blaming, right? And so it, it really, we need so many people to come and be part of this process, people who understand it. Because Jesus didn't say, go into all the world and have crusades, although I love them. That's how I began my mission work. He said, go into all the world and make disciples. And that's by relationship. If you try and disciple someone after they become a believer, you're usually too late because there's no relationship. And so you're starting, you're trying to do something that is artificial. And I, I think that's why it doesn't work. So we have classes for new believers and we do all these things like we try to do it. Discipleship is based on relationship. You know, you're in the same ship. And so we need people to come and be part of the ministry in every area like to take on the library and the Ministry Resource Center and to develop that so that Christian leaders can come from any of these nations around us here and we can love them and pray for them and they can, you know, they can study and, and we can connect people to their vision and we can look after them. But so we're waiting for someone to come that they have that vision. We're waiting for someone to come who will um, say, okay, my piece of the pie is I'll do this safe house so that when the kids are picked up on the street, the illegal alien kids, and they're thrown into lockup with all of the pedophiles and the crooks and the criminals, right? We have a safe house, and we work to get them into 
uh, Christian ministry in Cambodia and the countries they came from. But someone has to come to do that. I mean, maybe it's you. I don't know. Could be, you see. So we're spiritual opportunists here. And, and we look in the mirror so we know that God hasn't done all of this because of who we are. And so then, because we know who we are, we can believe in what God wants to do for you. If we came, you know, sort of with our ducks all in a row, all perfect, then it would be hard for us to believe for the people that God comes. But God is not concerned about credentials. He's concerned about heart issues. And there's all kinds of lines, we'll say, as Christian to Christian, that, that God is drawn in the sand. And he said, one Old Testament prophet said, God used to wink at this, but he doesn't wink anymore. And so all kinds of things that have gone on in the church up until now that God's put up with, he's not going to put up with anymore. If you're not laying hands on the sick, they don't need to be anointed. Right? If you're not going to speak edification, exhortation, and comfort, then quit dreaming about prophecy. Right? Like, like God is saying, heart issues. If we will give our life to covet, to edify, to exhort, and to comfort, then what a word of wisdom is needed, you've got the right mouth. Right? If, like, the, the miracles that are going to explode, we can't imagine. And years ago, God prophetically worked in my life. And I, I, I was so stupid then. I didn't know how to write down all this stuff. I just, I guess I thought he talked to everybody the same way. But he doesn't. And, he, and he, he told me just personally back then, you know, it gave me the understanding that, that the charismatic renewals that I was born into the kingdom in that, right? That that was like riding a bicycle. And if we couldn't learn to do that and not run people down and not hurt each other and not use our bicycle to give someone a ride and, you know, then he said, you'll never get the family car because you'll kill someone with the car. Well, the cars are coming, and God is looking for the people, and some of them don't even know who they are yet. Years ago in Asia, prophecy was given, I think from Singapore, that said the laborers are in the harvest. So you see, that was Pat. She was in the harvest just waiting for the right person to believe in her. If she came to faith in any other place, what God wanted to do with her life might have been diverted for someone else's cause, right? But here, we don't have any cause but the kingdom, right? That's the only cause we have, is the kingdom, which is why we call it mercy and not something else, because it says God in the midst of judgment that this city deserves, right? The prophet, right, said God in the midst of judgment, remember mercy. God wants to show mercy. We all know judgment's coming. So our job is to get the, the cry of mercy out there first. The only people that deserve judgment are those who have rejected mercy. Right? So the gospel is about mercy. If we don't understand mercy, we'll never really understand the gospel. Right? We, we reduce it to be about rules. I don't know what God's going to do. With This is becoming the transgender surgery capital of the world. And we've had them in our church. And what, what are we going to do with that? Like, I don't know. Except that I've walked out on the street and I've seen them. And I've been in their face when just for a minute they dropped the veil, you know, over their soul. And I saw them, and I went, oh. and they saw me, and they knew I saw them, and they went, oh. and then all of a sudden it was gone. But it was like they are that close to the surface. Imagine extreme prophetic people coming and walking the streets of this city, and God speaks to them and says, remember that time when this happened? That's when that came into your life, and God will set you free. That'll happen. One guy in Soy Six, who's a, a Katui lady boy, homosexual um, hairdresser, with tears down his face, he spoke to the Tamar Center girls, and he said, I don't know why God made me this way, but I hope in my next life it's different. 
and we just have to talk to him, right? And say, your next life can start like right now. You know, it's that close. So, um, so you kind of say, okay, that's another piece of the puzzle. Um, I, I believe in that, that in this area, the world came, and yes, the love of money is the root of all evil. And so the Asian people came and they sold their sons and their daughters into prostitution, and they do all of this stuff for love of money, right? But if we hadn't brought the money, right, we are the ones who made the market, right? The world needs to know that we owe a debt. There was a ministry um, by um, um, Pat Palm Rehab Center that was opening a center here in Patty on Walking Street, and they caught a huge offering from someone in America, anonymous. And they were telling us about this, and just like that, the Lord put in my mind, sin offering. It was a sin offering. Someone had been here, and it, you know, and somehow they had got connected when they got out of here back to their senses. So sin offerings are biblical. So I just, in Jesus' name, call in sin offerings. You know, to to make this right, because the money for the sin offerings went into the ministry of the temple, to the orphans and the widows, and the, you know. So spiritually, I believe the world owes a debt to this place, and that um, we really believe that, and that God wants to bring people from all over the world to be part of the answer, not only to bring the finances, but to bring the spiritual ministry, to come here and and be there for their nation and that even though this is really hard for us to keep going on like this because we know the answer could just come um, we believe that that it's really important that the right people get here first and so like Pat had to come while it was still at this point because that will be part of her story to tell but we have, we keep doing this, and we have ten months left to get this twelve million bought. And people go, like, uh, how much have you got? You say half a million. And they go, and you've got how long left? That we don't think it's about necessarily the money, although it would be really easy to look at that and panic. But there are people that God wants to be a part of this, and they're not all here yet. And that's more important to God's picture in the long run than, than just the issue of money. So um, God is using the work of mercy to make sense to the church. What does it mean to be a believer? What did he say that whatever I did, you go do the same? Well, it says Jesus went about doing good. That's not complicated. It's not rocket science. If you can't do anything else, then, you know, buy some rice and give it to someone. Or, you know, buy some clothes and go and go close some naked babies. Or, or go visit the prison and pray for them. Or, like, you find something to do and you prove to God that you're serious about this. That, that if the church is ever going to really be in the street, we got to take stuff. You know, we got to have stuff in our hands. And so, I just, for extreme prophetic, I, I believe with all of my heart that that's what God is doing here. And the extreme part is not just prophetic. God wants to be extreme. I mean, he wants the whole church to be extreme. There's a sign over the road. We'll take you down to see it. It says, Patia, the extreme city. I think it's a sign God wants us here, right? And that this place of mercy is to be an extreme place. And and we have to stretch every boundary except those that God has made. And then those ones that God has made, we have to just learn to weep over them. Because God's word's not going to change. But if we can't, like Jesus, look at them, see who they are, and love them, and speak the truth, then the love prepares their heart to receive the truth. What they don't need is turn and burn, right? They're already doing that. 
you know, what they need to feel is God's mercy at work. Everywhere Jesus went, everything he did, is that compassion moved him. Compassion is like the key to power. You know, in the days of, of the spirit-filled uh, spirit stuff, right? We all learn to, to um, we say, be filled with the spirit and speak in other tongues and, and okay, God sort of said okay. And a big part of that basket went sidetracked. And then God said, learn the word. And so then all people use the word and they use the letter of the law to kill, right? Or they use the, the letter of the law to blab it and grab it. like. And God said, okay, but part of the word was restored. And so we learn to be a charismatic people. We learn to be a people of faith and a people of God's word. And then the prayer movement came. And we learned to pray. And out of that came a remnant of people who became people of prayer. And then the prophetic move. And we learned not just to prophesy, but to be prophetic people. Right? And now, I think we're up to the end. That if we will pursue compassion, like we pursue prophecy and faith and intercession and all these other things, it's the key, right? Compassion moved Jesus, and he raised the dead, and he fed the hungry, and he taught the ignorant. And that, it, I just think, for me, okay, that's that's the simple thing for me. If we will pursue compassion and put ourselves in the place where where we will be fools, right? Just for the sake of, I'm going to go. God, because you were out there today, how can you not go? You have to go. You see, that's what the church needs. That the compassion of God so works in them that it's no longer a choice. We have to go, right? And, and if you can't go, I'll go for you. But you have to pray for me that when I go. So it, it's real partnership. It's not just send money and I'll go. But you have to say, God, I have to go, but I can't go. God, what can I do? So that the same compassion that grips me grips you. And then that's how you pray. And then that's how you give. Because the call is the same. Whether you're living in a have world or a have not world. The call is the same. Discipleship. Right? And if you really can't go, then you take that burden of God, I can't go. What can I do? Right? And then God will show everyone what to do. Because they can't go. But the call is to go. And not just go here. But that word means when you study that, right, and I study forever, he said, as you go, it didn't mean go there and do something when you get there. God wants people, as they live their life, to, to open our hearts and to see the, the cares that are there. And, you know, to just say, hey, you know, it doesn't have to be like that. And you might think I'm a fool and and, but I don't know, I, I just can see that you're really hurting. And so, do you want me to pray for you? And see, compassion will make you do that, no matter where you are. In the mall or in the market, you know? And if they say, are you crazy? <laughs> Get away from me, right? At least we've done it, and we've qualified to be anointed. And, and it grows, like, but people will never ever forget that. But I, I wager that eight people out of ten will fall apart right in your arms. Okay? You know, just walk up to someone and say, hey, I, I have no idea, I don't know you at all, but every time I look at you, I just feel something. Are you okay? Are you okay? And they go, because oh. <laughs> I've had it happen. And I've had it happen in church, and I've had it happen in very public, just out there places. I go, God, are you sure? But I've learned to trust that that longing and to say, I, I don't know what to say to you, but 
but uh, I'm a, a missionary. Like, does that make sense to you? You know, or, or whatever. And I stumble and and they go, oh my goodness, you know, like da 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 da. -da. So um, that that spirit that that is working all over the world, that prophetic spirit that is saying to the church, you know, wake up and do something, is not looking for more programs or more projects, it's looking for this move that we will passionately and persistently pursue the purpose of God's power, and it's them, it's not us. It's not about us feeling spiritual. Most days we don't feel very spiritual. Right? You know when we feel spiritual? Is when we get up and we go out there and we take the rice and we see the kid and we give it to them in like today when Pat said those two young men when they gave them the soap and the toothbrushes and the toothpaste and they just started to cry. And and they just closed their eyes, Pat said and said, Jesus. So we take the stuff but we teach them it's him. And you know, Pat said this morning, she brought all these bags. She said, what do you want me to do with it? And she said, do you want to keep it here? Do you want to put it in the storms? I said, Pat, this is your stuff. You need to go through it. And you need to take the stuff that you want to give away. And you do it yourself because it's your stuff. God's going to tell you. What if I had said, oh, that stuff is new. We can use that. Let's keep this here. Right? So... The church in lots of places has said, oh, we need that. Well, I'll tell you, it's God's stuff and we need to keep our hands off it. And even something so simple as a new bar of soap and a new toothbrush and toothpaste, if that is given, it's dedicated to God, it's korban, right, for you students. It's korban, it's dedicated to Him and you keep your hands off it. And if they don't take it out and give it away themselves, then um, we pray and say, okay, God, now where do you want it to go? Because they might say, we feel like we need to leave it to you. Then we'll distribute it. But we need to let them go, and we need to let them give it, because they're the ones that God wants to touch. Right? And so people say, well, I can give you my clothes. We say, no, you bring your clothes and you go give them yourself. Because... God wants them to know what it's like to get involved in His work. Right? That's what's at stake. And when people who don't know Him get involved in what He wants to do, and when the church will make way for people who aren't qualified to go and do the stuff that needs to be done, then I'll tell you, you can't stop the blessings of God that come. You just can't stop them. If I could say something to people, I would say that you really need to pray. You really need to say, God, what is the purpose of your power in my life? And then you go out and you walk. And God told us here, but you can do it anywhere. He said, you go and walk the streets, the towns of your city, and you ask to see with my eyes, to hear with my ears, and to feel with my heart. And then God said to us, the church, whatever they say, help them. See, I believe that's the purpose of the church. To help people be prophetic people, to help them become teachers, to help them nurture and learn how to shepherd and pastor each other, to help them hear God for each other, you know? So that's what we do here. and That's what God said to us. So we... If you want to come here, we want to go walking with you. And whatever God shows you, then we'll help you to do it. And that He has given to us as a gift. And I, I guard it and I treasure it. That gift of helping people find um, what God wants to do and helping them get started. And it may not be what they do the whole rest of their life, but I'll tell you, we could get you on the track and then it's up to them. We just welcome inquiries, questions, people, pray, donate. All of the donation information, the contact information will be on the website. All of the details about our program 
Mercy forms an umbrella of care based on Matthew 25 and James 127. Matthew 25, Jesus said, okay, did you visit the widow? He said, did you visit the sick and the prison and clothe the naked and feed the hungry and all that? And so that's like our checklist. And so those are the things mercy builds as an umbrella over the poor. And so, um, and James 127, that we would visit the widow and orphan. That word visit means get to know them, find out what's happening in their life and how can you help. It doesn't mean a cup of tea. It's a very practical, that word visit. So that's what we do. And the programs that do it are that we visit the prison three times a week, three prisons, the local lockup centers. That's where when they're scooped up off the street, they go there before they're sentenced. And so if they're picked up in a bathing suit, then they're in jail in a bathing suit. And we take them close. If they are picked up with children with them, then the children go in prison with them. And there you go. And so whatever it might be, if they're, if they're international people, we try and make sure their family or their embassy knows where they are. If they're Thai people, then we try and find out are they local. If they're local, it's like then we hit our target. Because when Pattaya changes, the whole nation will change. The whole face of darkness, and I don't mean this because we're grand, but because um, this is... This is such a throne of darkness. We have been told that people who are, are working in this, um, um, how do you say, manipulation that goes on in, in this country know that they will never really eliminate darkness. The best they can try and do is damage control. And so outwardly, it looks like they're trying to do programs, but really they're manipulating all the darkness into one place because there at least it's manageable. And okay, maybe that's that's good organizational stuff. But at first we went, oh my God, that's so ugly. But um, then we got really excited because we said, when we do it here, it will change everything. Because this is becoming the seat of darkness for, for this part of the world. For pedophiles, for pornography, for homosexual activity, for transgender surgery. We have every mafia from every country that's here. They all operate here. Like, it's bizarre. And the police and the social system here can never keep up with it. 75% of the people who are in this area are not taxpayers. Right? So, like, how can the city keep up with it? They need us. They want us. And God wants to give ingenious ways to answer and to partner with them. Some of our best friends are becoming um, city social workers and now police officers. And now we know someone who knows the superintendent of the non polite jail. So we've started working with the non polite jail. And so when there's babies in jail, we can go and help them and we can look after the babies and we can work with the parents who are in there so that they come, when they come out, they can have a whole new life. And although um, I, when people ask me, I don't think there's less bars in the city than there were. I don't think there's less crime. There's probably more. But what's happening is that the bar girls are knowing that they have a choice now. They can go to um, Fountain of Life has a women's training center. They can go to Tamar that has a women's training center. Um, they can send their children to us and so we'll look after them and yes they can get them when they come out and we'll work with them and work towards finding um, answers for their lives and so they're learning they have choices and I thought that was interesting at first we thought oh we're going to pray and all the bars are going to close down I, I don't know maybe all the workers are going to quit <laughs> so we don't know how it's going to come but now we have people who know mercy who live in the slums and they watch for where the children are abandoned. And they see if children are abandoned, they call us. And they'll call us before someone will come along and, and buy them or abuse them. So that's what we want. Yeah. We want the people to rise up with hope and dignity right? and to say, I don't have to live this way. I have some choices. I'm not cursed. We had a single mom her yesterday, and Maya and I spent an hour with her, and she said these children, 
are, are a, a burden to me because I was so awful in my other life. And so how does that translate to her beautiful little girls that are in our care? Right, that that's part of the worldview here, is that if your life is hard, it's because you were awful, and so that means these children are a curse. Children are not a curse, they're a blessing. But she doesn't know what else to do. So we talk to her about prayer and about, come on, we'll help you change. You know, we'll help you find a job and we can find your job and we can help someone to, can help you pay the rent and, and you can live with your children. And you don't have to be alone. And it's hard to convince them that they can really do that. They really want us to look after their children so they can just go. But, but we can't do that. Because God established family. Right? Anyway. So our children's shelter now. We have 20 children in the shelter. So we have the prison project. Three times a week we go to the prison with fruit and water. And um, we have, um, our prison leader is an amazing lady. And money from Australia has come. They've cleaned the prison. They've scraped the slime off the walls. They've painted it. They put in new floor. They read untimely. They, and the prison guards go like, what? And then they said, what about us? We need a fridge. So the prison project bought them a fridge. Because see, it's the guards that let us go in and do all this stuff. So now we have jail, prison once a month. We go in early and we do jail in prison. Right? And our next goal is to have a safe house. So that when, when they pick up children and moms with children, they don't have to go into the cells. They'll come to the safe house. And they'll let us get the illegal aliens from Cambodia back. And we can send them back to people in Cambodia who will help them and get them off the circle. Otherwise, they're dumped at the border. And the next guy picks them up and brings them back. Like, it's tragic. Do you know what they do here? There's so much construction here. They're in some places, they go to the border and they get all illegal clues. If they have kids, they come with them. They bring them in, they work for a month. When it gets close to the month in, someone reports to the immigration police. The police come and pick them all up and show them in prison. And guess what? They don't have to get paid. Isn't that sad? That's a lot of money. Whoa. So we can, can help that by having a safe house. So then we have scholarship students. We have 63 scholarship students now. And um, Bowie is our scholarship worker. Not only do we, education is free, but you have to have a uniform, you have to have books. Those things are not free. And so we provide that, but twice a year we do a big youth camp. And we disciple them. Once a month we, we have to find a sponsor that goes to take a, a special lunch out there. And again, we disciple them and we teach them to pray and teach them the future. It doesn't have to be like that, but man, we need more youth workers. So our scholarship program is really a discipleship program. And then through the children, we, we watch their families. You know, one student, their dad was shot. So we emailed their sponsor and said, we got a crisis in the family. And so that sponsor said, okay, I'll send some extra and get them through this. And so that's what we want. We, we want to change our world. And yeah, we want people to be educated, but we have a much different goal than just that. We want volunteers to come and help our students learn English and problem solve in English, and not just learn it in a book, but learn to, to think and talk. And if they can do that with grade 12, an ability to communicate and problem solve in English, they could almost write their own tickets, so we say. Because that's what people need. Right? They don't teach them in this nation, except for the elite and private schools, how to problem solve. Just do what you're told. And so if we can teach them to think and communicate and solve problems, God can give them witty ideas that can change their world and provide for their families. So we have, um, and then we have our slums project that goes out to the areas that we really pray God will lead us to. And, and we look for the poorest places we can find where there's no electricity and no running water and 
probably illegal and usually drugs, and we do whatever we have to do to, you know, but that's the heart, and we watch for children. And then we have the children's shelter. And the children who are in the shelter are there because um, that home is for children who are at direct risk of abuse by direct abuse or abuse by neglect. And it means if they're there, there's no one else to speak for them or intervene for them. Some are here for long term, some are here temporarily. And we just work to help sort out their very messy little lives and love them. So the little girl who, who saw her mother die, fallen down drunk from, from alcohol and yabba in the slums, and you were there today, right? That little girl in one day went from being afraid to now she smiles and waves and runs for hugs and blows kisses because that's what God can do. We took her to visit her father in prison and she doesn't know her father. So now we'll visit her father in prison. Now we know he is and begin to work with him to help him have a life when he gets up and hopefully have a life with this little girl. And if he doesn't want her, then we should do. She's beautiful. Yeah. So there you go. That's what we do here.